this moment of worship, remembering God's most profound gift to us. For indeed we serve a God who, while empowered to create this vast universe, chose with his own unique abilities to fashion this world for us and indeed with God's own hand scooped earth together made it in his image and blew into it his own breath and generations later here we are but not only that a God who seeing his creation in trouble planted in rebellion with no foreseeable way of its creating its own rescue chose to cast his lot left the heights of Godhead and in the fullness of time God sent his son that's the gospel of Christmas I'm delighted to be here along with my family here at the blades the small church with the big heart. I um, took the opportunity to send your pastor a message uh, this morning expressing my excitement to, to be here to worship with you. And I want to encourage you, of course, don't get weary of praying for your pastor. You know, the Bible says the promise is that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, the fervent prayer of the righteous is effective. So don't get weary in well-doing. I greatly esteem your pastor. Um, we had the privilege of working together, preparing for camp meeting. And uh, when you're at camp pitch, you have an opportunity to, to kind of uh, rub shoulders and, and, and uh, share your passion for ministry, as well as to kind of see what sort of character you're made out of. You know, because as pastors, we typically have... Uh, rather sedentary jobs oftentimes are sitting a lot and so camp pitch gives us an opportunity to to kind of reacquaint ourselves with nature and the dignity of manual labor and um Noah and i struck up many a conversation he has a passion for the word of god and for his people and uh, i was encouraging him you know the lord has a, a strange way of uh, bringing out of very uncomfortable situations, a unique blessing. And it is my firm belief that God has a unique blessing and testimony for your pastor. And he's gonna bring him through this. And um, I was uh, particularly struck when I learned of his malady, um, of how grave an illness it is. Uh, I remember early in my ministry, we lost a young man in Newport News uh, because of a similar failure to diagnose it on a timely fashion. And so God has already been merciful, but we believe also that God is faithful and will bring him through and will increase his strength day by day and return him to you. That is my prayer. I'm uh, excited to renew my relationship here at the Bladensburg Church. Uh, it dates back ooh, well over 30 years ago when I was a teenager and first had the opportunity to come here with Pine Forge Academy Choir. Uh, a tradition which I'm delighted to hear continues. My sons were kind of excited to learn that we we're coming here because they were just recently here also with the choir. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased that relationship continues. Um, but you know, God is good. Uh, you know, that's always a, a particular delight to come. It seems wherever I go, I'm always seeing familiar faces and the Drew family, of course, and uh, the Cantu family, et cetera. It's, it's wonderful to, uh, to see you here at the home church and to know that God is doing a mighty work here. And I want to just encourage you, um, you know, you're, you're part of a, a sisterhood of churches. When the uh, D.C. area ministerium, the collegiate of pastors, uh, learned of Pastor Washington's illness, at least the graveness of his illness, we committed collectively to make sure that his church family would be taken care of, that your pastor would not have to worry. And that every Sabbath, one of us is going to be here until he returns. And I want to reestablish that commitment to you and know that for us, it is not um, some kind of chore or errand. It is a privilege for us. It's an honor for us. And we're delighted to share this moment with you. Yes, a blessing upon God. It's communion Sabbath. As such, um, 
I have chosen not to uh, test your forbearance. Uh, we will have um, a brief but insightful look into scripture uh, this morning, if that's all right. We have already shared together the, the primary text, which is for me in the, the Gospel of John, the third chapter, those wonderful verses of reassurance in the 16th and 17th verses of the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for these poignant reminders of a God who loves us, a God who provides for us, a God who redeems us, and a God who has promised to return for us. And we ask now that in these next few minutes, as we open your word and seek to find inspiration and comfort, that the Holy Spirit would minister to us as only the Holy Spirit can and give to each of us that which we need Glad in our hearts, water our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to uh, turn to yet another gospel, the gospel of Luke, and to review with me in the first chapter a story which is on the one hand familiar and yet is still powerful with its ability to inspire. I have never been all that enamored with uh, what some would see as the, how should I say it, the, uh, the specter of preaching per se. I believe that there is power in the word of God and in the simplicity of the word, regardless of who we are, what station in life we find ourselves, if we take the time to earnestly read it and to allow it to sink in, the true power is found in the word, not in the person of a preacher. And so I'm hoping that you'll indulge me today. I hope, first of all, you brought your Bible. You didn't come naked or weaponless, I should say. I'm going to review portions of the first chapter of Luke in that marvelous story and then take from it certain things I'd like for us to keep in mind. Beginning in verse 5, the Bible says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. But now it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the customs of the priest's office, for his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. I'm skipping here now to verse 11. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. But he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? 
for I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am set to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Dropping now to the 26th verse. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin, a young woman espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. I want to talk a little bit about the gift of God. And I want to remind you of the God whom you and I claim to serve today. Is a God who on the one hand is, is somewhat predictable in how God acts, at the same time he's unconventional, working through unexpected ways, unexpected means. We have read here in the first chapter of Luke about a childless priest whose aged wife becomes pregnant while he is struck speechless. God insists that the child will not take the assumed traditional root of all children. That is to say, he will not grow up like his father. He will not be named after his father. He will not assume his father's profession. God is about to do a new thing generations of priests who in and of themselves produce generations of priests are now about to produce a prophet and while the priest lot was to work in the splendor of white granite and gold plated instruments this boy named John would grow up to work in the rock strewn wilderness with only his voice as an instrument and while his father and his father's predecessors worked in fine linen garments and ate from the choicest animal sacrifices. This man would be clothed in camel's hair. This man would scrounge for food from the land, even if it meant eating insects as a main course and wild honey as dessert. The most important and anticipated event since the creation, and that is to say Messiah has come, the Christ, the anointed one, and yet we see a God who chooses to inform the world of this, not through the churchified folk, not through the priests and the religious leaders, those who work in the temple, not whom we would assume God would entrust the message to, but instead God chooses shepherds to make the, the news, working class, simple folk. He entrusts shepherds, untrained, disrespected, Shepherds he entrusts with the most critical message 
ever to reach earth since creation that Christ is born. I speak about a God who entrusts the raising of his son to a teenage peasant girl and her blue collar husband in an isolated region where the people talk funny in some backwater town with a seedy reputation. That's what Nazareth is. God forces the people out of their comfort zone so that he can powerfully reach the masses. And so Bladensburg, I want you to be reminded of your mission today. You know, we, we live in a land that is always impressed with the large and the powerful. We are part of a nation which has seen the establishment of mega churches where tens of thousands of people congregate and have these elaborate televised meetings and these wonderful liturgies and these eloquent speakers. And yet I would think that if God would return today that he would bypass all that and likely find himself amidst a small company of fervent believers. Something like Bladensburg, I suspect. A place where you can come and everybody knows you, where you can't hide, where it doesn't matter about your pedigree or where you come from, you know. I suspect that uh, we need to reacquaint ourselves with a God who tends to think outside the box. A God who says, keep in mind that my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I do things in a different way than you would. And so it's imperative for you then to reacquaint yourself with me and then to follow me because I may be leading you in a manner that you haven't thought of, in a manner that you don't expect. God has a different standard of what's important in life. I think of the 25th chapter of Matthew where the Bible shares with us on that great day of judgment when we have to stand before God and give an account for our life that rather than quiz us about church attendance and correct understanding of doctrine, it's the cup of water in a time of thirstiness. It's the thoughtful gift of clothing. It's the timely visit of the sick or the encouraging visit to the imprisoned that God is interested in. It is not so much a matter of how much tithe and offering we give. And though Jesus reminds us, yes, tithe is important. You know, uh, right learning and right speaking, those things are important. But the weightier matters, the weightier things, the more important things. What about love, justice, mercy, faith? These are the things that matter. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, we have this promise beginning in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Changed how, church? In a, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. I've always been enamored with that phrase from the time I was a child. In a twinkling of an eye. In an instant. In order to live with God, we shall be instantly changed. I mean, think of that. But on the other side of that, when God then prepared God's self to dwell with man, God put on human flesh, not in a moment, but rather God chose to endure the full human experience, that full gestation process, that full birthing process is how God became man. God does things in an extraordinary manner, in an unusual fashion. And when we come before this table, it is to serve as a reminder of this God. This God who, hmm, as I think about this being a Christmas Sabbath, people often use Christmas as a reminder that Christ has come. But in fact, it should remind us also of Christ's promise, Christ will come. And that's part of what this table serves to remind us of. It is a message of Christmas. You know, at Christmas time as a child, you, you, you always look forward. It seems like Christmas is, is one of the best times of the year because, of course, you get stuff. And uh, 
There are those bright decorations and lights. It's a, t it's a time really of, of wonderment for a child. And it seems as if the Christmas would never ever get here when you're a kid. But eventually it does. And even as Christ came the first time, I want to encourage you as a church family, he's coming again. Oh, don't, don't even trouble your mind about so much time has gone past, you know, and, and it's always a fascinating time to hear how people have this discussion about the historical Jesus, you know, whether or not he's truly the son of God and where he was buried and what they, all that's nonsense. He came, he's coming again. That's the thing that we have to, hatch on, that we have to latch on to. It's a message which is often lost in this commercialized jingle bellisms of America. Christmas is not a time to merely remember Christ's birth, but to remember a time of Christ's promise. I will come again, he says, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so it is how fitting a time for us to come together to celebrate a communion. For while others find satisfaction with gifts placed under a tree, we today find assurance from a gift that was nailed to a tree. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That is the gospel. And this is what we are celebrating today in this moment of communion. May God bless us all as we receive the emblems of his body and blood. And now, Father, we affirm our belief and our faith in you. We also express our thankfulness in your gift to us, which we receive gladly today. And we pray, Lord, that as we partake of this meal together, that we shall see beyond the simple symbols, a bit of bread, a sip of juice, but rather cause our minds to dwell on that most precious gift. And we thank you today for hearing our prayer, for accepting us, as we in turn present our bodies back to you as living sacrifices. And we do so in Jesus' name and the hope of his soon return. Let the church say amen.